You're listening to the world's smartest podcast network. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Majoring in Everything. I'm your host, Andrea Jones-Roy. I'm here in my kitchen with my knives. And today we are joined by a very exciting guest. I am so excited to have her on the show. Her name is Paula Croxon, and she does a million things that I'll talk about in mere moments, and then hopefully she'll talk about. But first, let's welcome Paula to the show. Welcome, Paula. Hi. Hello. Hooray. Hooray. So nice to see you. Thank you for doing this. So, Paula, what I like to do when I start the show is say what I think a person does, and then you tell me if I've got it right. Because a lot of the time, our guests on this show do lots of things, and I have reasons that I think, oh, I'd love to hear about this person's experiences and their many interests, but everyone is more complicated than they seem on their website. So tell me if, if I've got this right. So I know you as a neuroscientist, as well as a science communicator and a storyteller. And in particular, you do those things through a company called Story Collider, which we'll talk about in a moment. Plus you play the flute and you're an open water swimmer. That's what I got through my research. How did I do? You did really well. Nice. That is great. Uh, the only edit I would make uh, is that I am no longer working as a researcher full time. Okay. Uh, because I changed careers to focus on the science communication a little over three years ago now, and um, and so and so I suppose that shouldn't come first, really. But I do I still do a little bit of research um, okay. on the side. Okay. How would so you? My side gig those? became my main gig. My main gig mm. is my side gig. Nice. The old good for the goose is good for the gander or whatever the expression. Exactly. Is. Yes. So what order would you present your, I don't, I don't, what, shall we call them jobs, interests? I never even know what, what, I don't even know where to start with the basics for, for people like us who do millions of different things. Are they, they're not hobbies, right? No, I get paid for some of them. Yeah, so, good, right. <laughs> so I guess those are jobs. Um, yeah. so, so my main job is at Columbia University. Okay. Um, so I work in an institute called the Zuckerman Institute, which is relatively new, and it's a neuroscience institute. Uh, it's in a big shiny glass building in Harlem, and I run the public programs here. So I think that's what used to be called Out Science Outreach. Ah. but now does not. So outreach kind of implies that we sit in our ivory tower and, and we, and we hand out science to right. hey, you have, have some science. Yeah. Um, you, you look like you need some science. Like yeah. exactly. Welcome. You know? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so now public programs, I think more encompasses that, that we, that we welcome people in, that we mm. collaborate with people that we sometimes leave our ivory tower and we go to the place like? of our collaborators. Yeah. It's terrifying. It's terrifying yeah. to be out there in the world. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I like being covered by ivory you know, when I can help it. Yeah. Always, always. Yeah. So yeah, I think it, it, it implies that we we're doing many, many different ways of, of making science accessible and bringing science to people. Um, and we have a particularly uh, close focus on Harlem and Upper Manhattan and the South Bronx, who are our neighbors. So that that's kind of my main job. Okay. And, and that's where you are right now, beaming in. That's where I'm show. beaming in from. I have, I have my brains and books in the background here. Fabulous. And then my part-time job is that I work for the Story Collider, uh, which is a nonprofit uh, that aims to share true personal stories about science. And uh, so I'm a senior producer for them, which means that I help to produce shows. I sometimes host shows uh, and I teach a lot of workshops uh, to scientists and non-scientists about how to use storytelling to communicate. Excellent. Okay. And then the flute playing, where does that fit? How often yeah, that's are you? That's not a job. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> not a lot of money in flutes these days. You know, my mother may, okay. I was airing of grievances is happening early in this episode. My mother made me play the flute growing up and I really hated it. So you can persuade me. Otherwise I wanted to play the drums or the cello and the flute is the opposite of those two instruments, as far as I can tell. But now I can tell her there's no money in the flute. So she was wrong. This is all <laughs> about my mother. <laughs> But, but sell it on me. What, what's so, so you play the flute for like rock bands and stuff, right? So I do now, but I started off like every child playing the recorder. Yes, same. And, and uh, actually it was my mom who encouraged me to take up the flute. So she, she was a pianist and a cellist. Uh, my sister took up the cello um, and 
I, but I was just really good at the, like freakishly good at the childhood instrument, the recorder. Nice. So I, she, I thought no one was good at the recorder. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. No, those of us who play wind instruments all started there. Basically I was, I was teaching a class with a saxophonist who's a professional. There's money in saxophone. Oh, noted. Yeah. And, um, and he started on the recorder as well. So there you go. Okay. So anyone listening out there who was like, you know what I was good at the recorder, you potentially have a future in woodwinds. So, yeah. And I strongly suggest based on my two person sample from this morning, saxophone, Definitely saxophone, but he's yeah. also really, really good. And, and I am, and I am just, I'm a lot better than I deserve to be for the amount that I practice. Mm, a true gift is one of those that you just mail it in and you're great. I like it. Well, I did a lot of practicing as a kid. So my mom actually took up the flute, uh, for herself. Uh, I think before I took it up and she was just, she was just always learning new instruments and she, kind of said you know if you want to learn I'll teach you and like all children everywhere I was like no I don't want my mother to teach me this right. thing um but later I kind of relented so I kind of did a combination of lessons at school and lessons from her and she definitely taught me more than any of the teachers at school did wow. well done and to your mother I know. And so I had this really rigorous classical training. So I put in a lot of hours up front <laughs> and I think that's why I get away with not putting in many hours now. Nice. So uh, when I started my PhD, I didn't really have time to play a lot of music and I kind of didn't do it for a while. And then when I moved to New York, I was in a bar at a party we used to do that, remember? Like uh, go vaguely. to places yeah. and sit next to people that we didn't know before and wow. with our faces just like naked. Yeah, yeah, just mouths out. It's just wild. Incredible. So I yeah. was sitting next to this very strange guy who was on his phone a lot and he wanted me to like his Facebook page for his band. Okay. Um, and, and then later I ended up joining that band. Wow. <laughs> um, because... I think initially they had one song that they thought it might be cool to have a cello or a flute or, mm. or something on. And I was like game to try that. And I tried playing one song and they kind of reeled me in. They were like, do you want to play a show at the Mercury Lounge? Nice. And I was like, obviously I want to play a show at the Mercury yeah, Lounge. That's a legit spot. Well done. Are you sure you want me to play a show at the Mercury yeah. Lounge? Um, and they took a chance on me. And, and so I've been playing with them ever since. Um, so that's Marlo Gray. That's that's the New York-based band that I play with. The other band is a band of professors of neuroscience who nice. play at conferences. And we play covers of like rock and punk songs for fun. And uh, we haven't met for a while because we haven't been to any conferences, but hopefully right. we will again. They don't hire you for Zoom conferences or invite you for Zoom conferences uh, to play? No, I did one Zoom conference project with with a friend of mine and some other professors uh, right early on in the pandemic. Um, but Pavlov's Dogs, the professor band I, I'm in most frequently, we haven't done I see. much. Some of them had a lot of energy early on in like March and April of 2020, they were like, yeah, let's do some projects. And we I all was had like, a lot of energy back then. I think, no, I did. I didn't have any energy. Oh, and I was you. like, no, yeah. I can't handle anything else. So I didn't participate in any of that, but it's nice to be back playing again. We've been back playing since the vaccines were available basically okay. in, in New York. So that's been great. Awesome. So people in New York city can come find you or people can come visit New York and come see Marlo Gray, which according to your website, you opened for the Gin Blossoms, which feels like a very big deal. So well we done did. there. We did. That's it was cool. really, really cool. That's um, very cool. That's definitely the biggest show we've played, and it was awesome. Well done. So I want to back up and talk about uh, the dreaded PhD. Well, I shouldn't say dreaded, but we've had a number of other guests on here where we've talked about, let's say, the pros and cons of the PhD program. When Did you go... I always like to know the order, especially when I have guests who are in the sciences and the arts, such as you. Did you, it sounded like you started with music and then when you went to PhD, no music. How did, what, what is the evolution of the, the weaving between science and art for Paula look like? So I think I had a decision to make before I went to university about science or music. 
And it was a really easy decision for me to make because I did not learn to play the piano as a kid. Again, because I didn't want my mom to teach me. <laughs> our poor mothers. Let's just shout such out a, to our mothers. Yeah, I would give anything for my mother to teach me anything right now. I really would. But, you know, that's what you learn as an adult way too late. Right. And so I, I really knew that I wasn't going to have a musical career without being able to play the piano. It was going to be hard for me to compose. Like I could only compose with like my two finger piano playing and a computer program, you know, it was just, it wasn't possible really. So I, I, I put a lot of my energy into science and I also was good at it and I loved it, especially biology. And I used to do um, like illicit science projects at school. That's how much of a nerd I was. Wow. I don't biology. even know what an illicit science project is. I did a project with my friends on mold and fungus and I wanted to grow all of these different molds on different foods. And the school were like, no, right. You it's can't dangerous. bring <laughs> these toxic substances into the school. And so I did it in my airing cupboard. And then I brought them into school in, in like a little seal container. And we looked at them outside. Um, and then the, I think the teachers thought we were doing drugs right. or something interesting. If only. And <laughs> they were really disappointed when they caught us looking at mold. Hang on. What's an airing container? Is that what you said? Oh, an airing cupboard. It's an airing like, cupboard. it's like the cut. It's <laughs> I guess not to totally thing. derail on probably what's just like slightly different words, but I have no idea what that is. It's, it's the cupboard where your boiler lives and it's warmer than the rest of the house. Um, so if you have a house with its own boiler in and then what you can just put a shelf in there and you can put your clothes in there after you wash them. Um, and they like stay nice and toasty. Wow. Okay. As someone who lives in a tiny apartment with no anything, I have no idea what any of those things are, but that sounds awesome and yeah. much more environmentally friendly than putting my clothes in the dryer, which I have done sometimes or drape them on the heater, which is probably a fire hazard. So, okay. I mean, I now live in New York too, so I do no those boiler rooms. Wow. Well. So, I no judgment. You, you grew mold in there, took them to school. Teachers were disappointed. It wasn't drugs. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe the they were relieved. Was, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Um, and so, and so I kind of had this like love deep, yeah. deep seated love for biology <laughs> already. Very cool. And, and one of my teachers said, you should apply to Cambridge university. And I said, what's that? Because I had no, I just had no idea, really. I, I wasn't quite first generation because my mom did go to university for a, for a year or two, and then she chose to drop out. Um, but my, I had an aunt who was a doctor who'd done the whole medical school. But apart from that, I didn't really like know anything about these like red brick Ivy League universities. Um, but I had just had this great advocate and this teacher who I think wanted the school to look good, right? He wanted some people from the school to go to Cambridge. Sure. But he also was a great advocate for me because I didn't don't think I would have done that otherwise. And I didn't get the best grades because I was so determined to study music all the way through, even though I wasn't going to use it for anything. I just didn't want to give up that side of myself. You know, I had been teaching music at school and that was my spare time job. And I just, I started a band at school and I just like really wanted it to be part of myself. And as a result, I got like slightly worse grades than I should have done. Right. And I didn't get in to Cambridge on the day that I got my exam results. I missed out on one of my grades by, I think it was like a sixth of a percent. It was so close. Oh, I had a physical reaction that hurts. And my, the head teacher of my, of my, uh, of my sixth form college, which is like my high school. Um, he was like, Oh, I'll call them. And I just had no idea that someone could do that for someone else, that someone could get on the phone and, call somebody else and potentially make a change to something that seemed to me to be just like done. Right. And something so huge. Right. And I have no idea if it made a difference that he did that. One. I don't know if he knew anybody on the other end of the phone or not, right. but the fact that he was willing to do that stayed with me my wow. whole life. And, and ultimately they did have a system for taking people who missed, just missed their grades because some people miss their grades by a lot more. And they had sort of great shuffle and I ended up getting offered a place anyway Nice. and taking it. And, and that's kind of when I, and I still played music in university, but that's when I started to really kind of, I guess, figure out 
what kind of scientist I was going to be and what I was going to really focus on. And I guess I think the music played a smaller and smaller part in my life after that for quite a long time until I realized how much I missed it. Was that reluctantly or without even noticing it as you were more and more focused on sort of the the path ahead and your interests, right? Was it a sad parting or was it a, it just kind of happened? I think it's always been a bit of a choice. It's, it's, there's always a choice between how much time to put in to something Mm -hmm. that I have to think about. I'm not the kind of person who does things by halves. Mm -hmm. And so (laughs) if I was going to be really focused on science, I just didn't have the ability to excel at every other single thing that I was doing. And because I had this other part of me, this this swimming part of myself that existed, um, I had to balance that as well. And so my first year at university, I had a really great time. Uh, It was probably the first time I really had like several friends and like a social life of sorts. Awesome. I had a little bit of a social life when I was when I was in, in school, but mostly I didn't. <laughs> I, I mean, someone had to grow that mold with you, but uh, yeah, I see. What right, you're and Cambridge is full of nerds, and so right. I just fit in for the first time in my life. It was right. incredible, really, for me to be in that environment with I'm other so nerds. Yeah, many of whom were much nerdier than me, and they were all very confident. And I was like, "Wow, if these people are confident, maybe <laughs> I can be confident too." <laughs> And so I was having fun and I was, I was, so at school, I was a synchronized swimmer. I did synchronized swimming in graduate school, which is a very embarrassing age to start synchronized swimming, but very cool. Did you grow up to synchronized swimming? I, well, I swam like regular style until I was about 11 or 12. Okay. And again, my mom, who's my inspiration for all things, uh, except the science, which was never her thing. Yeah. Uh, she took up synchronized swimming. Your um, mother sounds awesome. I just have to she, say. <laughs> she was. She yeah. was the most awesome person. And so she took up synchronized swimming as an adult. Nice. Um, so to- and totally had a great deal of fun with it. And I think I went along. I like tagged along to a session or something. And I thought it was cool. And then we found out there was a club. And the choice for me was between going down the swimming route, the competitive swimming route, which was at 5 a.m. Yeah, it's always the- at 5 a.m. I don't know why. I did some swimming growing up too. It was like, well, we'll see you at, at, before the sun comes up. Like, why Why can't you swim during the day? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because yeah, I guess the answer is because they want to do swimming lessons during the day. And you, you, I guess yeah. there's not space for everyone. And so, or synchro was in the evenings. Nice. I guess it's called artistic swimming now. I should As of like a year right. or two ago. Yeah. But we can, we can call it synchro on this podcast if you prefer, because I'm, I, I have it burned into my head that it's synchro as well. And I have too. a pair of shorts that says synchro on it. And I feel like I can't wear those if it's artistic swimming. So synchro exactly. it is. Sorry okay, to the so listeners synchro. who are really into artistic swimming as the new name. So my, my apologies. We're it's just slow synchro. to adjust today. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. So I, I was doing, yeah. So synchro was in the evenings. Nice which is much, much better. Um, and so I just, and my parents, I think were holding their breath to see what I would choose. And I feel like the first time I had to decide between spending all of my time on, on one thing or another was, was cause I was quite good at synchronized swimming, I guess. And I got to the point where I was invited to compete in like the, the regional team. So Ooh. to go to the nationals. Wow. And I wasn't, it wasn't a sure thing that I would get into the team, but I was invited to go train with them. And it was exactly the same time as I was doing all of that science stuff to, to get those grades that would get me into university or no. And I, and I felt like it was the first time I made a really conscious decision to put something on the side Mm. and say, you know, actually I can't do that. If I do that, my grades are going to suffer and I'm not going to be able to go to where I want to go. And I, yeah. And I guess for me, I was like, there's no money in synchro. Um, not yeah. wrong. I think, I don't know. Correct me if there are people making a lot of money with synchro out there, but I think that's right. So that was the first casualty feels too depressing, but that was the first like, okay, this has been fun, but 
I've got to focus. Yeah. 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 But then when I got to university, you know, I, there was no synchro team, but I joined the water polo team nice. instead, <laughs> uh, which was great. And so I was it's- doing that. And then I was playing in the orchestra and a, and a wind quintet. And then I found out I could make money playing Gilbert and Sullivan, like in the orchestra pit, you know, oh, and, yeah. um, and so I was doing that and I was doing some partying and then my studies were like kind of, you know, over there. And I had a really rude awakening at the end of my first year at university when I did really, really badly. Mm. And I kind of got hauled in, you know, mm. for a sort of disciplinary chat. And they wow. were like, if you, if you do any worse, you're going to fail. And failing at Cambridge is just failing. There's no retakes. There's no repeat years. You're just gone if you fail. Like they just kick you out of the whole thing. It's not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so they were like, hey, what what's going on for you? You know, are you cut out for this? That's true. Yeah. They doubted sincerely that I was cut out for it or that I was smart enough, which now that I think about that is is like incredibly rude. Yeah. Like out loud to you, they expressed these questions and doubts. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. What did you say? I said, I think it's probably because I'm spending all my time doing other things. (laughs) Good answer. Yeah. (laughs) So I, yeah, I actually, I'm surprised now because I wasn't, I wasn't a particularly, I don't know. I, I was like pretty shy when I was younger and I, don't remember having this much composure, but this, this is what I remember saying that, that um, I don't think it's that at all. Yeah. I don't think it's that I lack the ability to do this. It's just that I've been doing. And then I kind of listed all of these things that I was doing. And I said, I think if I just, if I just stopped doing some of those things and made more time to study that I would have what it takes to do this. Yeah. And the great thing about that was it was kind of provable, right? I could test that hypothesis, put it into action. Right. Um, and, and yet they were wrong. It wasn't that I didn't have the ability or the intelligence or whatever it was that they thought I lacked, um, you know, male attributes perhaps. Right. But and to go was, to that first, right? You've never talked to this student before and to just say, well, you probably don't belong here. It's like, have you heard of opportunity costs? Okay, well, all right, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'm glad, I'm really glad. And, I, and it kind of made me determined to prove them wrong. Um, yeah, so I proved them all wrong and I did much better in my second year. But again, I had to make that decision. Right. I so had you- to pull back from some things and I did a lot less music okay. after that. I stayed in the orchestra, but that was it for music. So synchro is totally gone. Music is gone except for the orchestra and you're studying all the time, basically, or being well, water polo was still there. Ah, nice. Well done. I justified that that because, you know, I knew that physical activity was also important for the health. Right. Um, and I I think I've always relied on it for my mental and physical health. Same. Same. So that was kind of not an option to not do that. And if I was going to do it, I was going to do it at a pretty competitive level because, of who I am. Yeah. What are going to do? Just have do something for fun? Forget it. Yeah. That's all. Awesome. I didn't quite quit everything. And, and I'm glad I didn't quit everything. Um, in Cambridge, there's this thing where people go for a first. So a first class degree is the highest degree that you can get. And these days, I probably would need one to get into a PhD program. Wow. But luckily, this was a long time ago. And I like 20 years ago and you didn't need a first to get into a PhD program. I also didn't know I wanted to do a PhD then. Um, And so I chose to work really hard and study hard and do everything that I needed to do. And that I also wasn't going to quit everything that was important to me and be sad and stressed. Well done. So what took you to a PhD program? At what point did you decide that was the place for you? So I was a little bit confused about what I wanted to do when I left university. And I had a friend who had done some summer work at a pharma company. Hmm. And he said he knew of an opening at the pharma company. And would I be interested in working there for a little bit? 
And it was really appealing for two reasons. Firstly, it was just north of London and all my friends had just moved to London pretty much. And secondly, it was, it felt like something I might want to do. It was science every day. Uh, It was incredibly well paid compared with what I would have done if I got like a research assistant type job or something like that. Um, And it bought me some time right before I had to decide what to do next with my life. Right. You might as well make a ton of money or (laughs) near London. Yes. It wasn't. Now we look back, it wasn't a ton of money, but it was more money than I'd ever seen. Sure. Uh, or thought about. And and it was, you know, it was enough for me to save up and then go traveling for a few weeks before I did whatever was next. And it was just a one-year thing. I ended up taking this like one-year job. Um, I became a biochemist, which was not maybe my forte. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I had done neuroscience like in Cambridge, you do very general stuff for the first couple of years, and then you specialize. And I specialized in neuroscience. And neuroscience is, is uh, a mix of really a ton of different disciplines, everything from physics, computer science, um, math, all the way down to like biology, genetics. So you really can do anything within that. So I, I just happened to end up in this microbiology lab, um, uh, bi- biochemistry lab, where we were like doing things like looking um, for targets um, from this huge library that they had. Oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this. How long does an NDA last? I don't know, but I'm very excited to talk about something that might be illegal to talk about, but we don't have to. So you're, I have no idea. Let's talk about it. Are you sure? (laughs) I mean, it was so long ago. It was so long ago. I think I can be very, very, very general. So they have these huge libraries. Let me just start again for the recording. (laughs) They have these huge libraries of compounds that just sit in freezers that they've collected from all over the place. They're everything from like frog venoms and like bits of leaf from the rainforest to like, you know, compounds that they are already using to treat other things that are on the market that are made by the pharma company and everything in between. And I was working on a project with these with these receptors um, in the brain that are known as orphan receptors. And they're known as orphan receptors because we don't know what activates them. Wow. So we have like the dopamine ones and the serotonin ones and and the glutamate ones, which which are like the common ones. Some of them everybody's heard of even. Right. Um, And then you have these orphan receptors that we just don't know what they're activated by, presumably something that's naturally made, but maybe also could be the target for a drug um, that would do something amazing. And we would what just have percentage to figure out what of receptors are orphan receptors? This sounds like the like dark matter of the brain, though. I guess there's gray matter too. I'm out of my league. I don't know. There is gray matter. <laughs> there is gray but matter. But that's like most of it. Okay. Um, no, then uh, unlike dark matter, which I think is like the majority of all matter, um, they are like a minority. I see. I don't, see. Like okay. less than, I actually don't know what, but like a very, very small okay. percentage, maybe less than 1% even of receptors but I might be making that up. It might be more than that. And listeners fact check us, tell us what's uh, (laughs) exactly the orphan. I'll say a few and then you can choose the (laughs) right. But yeah, not many of them, but, but enough to be interesting. So I was working on that project for a while. Um, I I just wanted to kind of give an example of like what this kind of biochemistry stuff is. So in this case, we had like a, a color changing assay. So there were cells that had these receptors in. And if the receptors were activated by whatever I gave them, then they would change color. And essentially my job was to be a robot. Mm. There weren't enough robots to do all of the steps of adding the things to the cells. And so my job was primarily to move things from robot to robot and then occasionally do the job of a robot. Wow. Yeah. Inspiring. (laughs) It sounds like, yeah. So I was just kind of replacing the robots and and I was curious to know how one got a job making the decisions about what to work on. Right. And how one got to like the next stage up. And and unsurprisingly, I was super ambitious. And I found out that the people making all the decisions in the pharma company have PhDs. Ah, I see. And I also found out it's really hard to do a PhD in pharma because sometimes they change projects 
based mm. on external factors, like whether or not they think it's going to be profitable or if a competitor has got a certain way down the road. And so sometimes people's PhDs take a really long time because they have to change what they're working on or they're only allowed to do it at like 4 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. And so I decided that I would have to leave leave pharma, go to academia, do a PhD in a university, and then I could come back if I wanted to and make mm. the decisions um, about what I was going to do. Right. And tell the young people how to be robots and so on. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Live I wanted dream. that robot overlord kind of power. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> we all, we all do. Yeah. <laughs> That's an amazing, I hope it was on your personal statement for the PhDs. Like I'm seeking robot overlord power. Uh, so admit me, please. Thank you. I, I didn't say that. I, I don't really think I knew what I was doing <laughs> yeah. um, at all. Like I was kind of applying to these various, I didn't know what I was interested in working on. Um, I didn't know if I was a biochemist or, or something else. Uh, I had done this project as an undergraduate that was like a behavioral neuroscience project, which is looking at the behavior of animals and recording from, from their brains as they were behaving um, in like specific situations. And so I just kind of wasn't sure what I was into. And so I was applying all over the place and I was not doing super well. Mm. Um, but luckily I found a program that was more like the US system, which had um, like a general year where you got a master's and you did lab rotation. So you did like a few weeks in each lab or a few months in each lab and you tried Mm. Try try before you buy model right. basically, right. and I somehow managed to get into that program, and that was at Oxford University, the sworn enemies That's of right. my alma mater. That's right. What a traitor! A traitor among us. I see. All right. Yeah, I have no friends now. Right. Basically, <laughs> unforgivable. That's why you moved to the U.S. I'm sure was because of that slight. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's accurate. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No yeah, one would yeah. talk to me. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so then I moved. So then I I moved to Oxford and I and I got to try a few different things. And I think I love that system. For me, it was really what I needed. There are some people who know exactly what they want to do and can really hit the ground running. But I really needed to try a few different things to figure out what it was that was for me. Same. Albeit ending up right back in behavioral neuroscience. But I needed that year. Yeah, that like the, the Amish year abroad or something to just totally steal at something that's not related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then did yes. you go from there into academia? Were you full time professor, et cetera, et cetera? All of that, like the the whole shebang? So I yeah. Uh, yeah. Except um, in the kind of research I did, it's really common to do a postdoc. Ah, yeah. So after I finished my Ph.D., I. I had decided at that point that I didn't want to go back into industry. Okay. I think I'm trying to remember why now. It was mostly because I sucked at biochemistry. <laughs> that's like what I tell my students. Like, what if I'm bad at it? You're like, well, that's information. So there you go. Yeah. I think it was mostly because I wasn't good at it. And I think also I just, uh, yeah, I kept wanting this freedom. I had got a grant yeah. during my PhD and in the grant, I could like say what I was going to work on. And I was just searching for as much freedom as possible to do what I wanted to do and what I thought was important. And it just seemed like, like staying in academia would give me that route. Right. And so I ended up getting a postdoc um, with this guy who worked in my same department and he worked on monkeys. Mm. Uh, he, I mean, he worked on them for a reason. He was interested in memory, the kind of memory that gets lost when people develop Alzheimer's disease or dementia. It's We call it episodic memory, but you can kind of think of it as your autobiographical memories of your life. So the memories of, of kind of what happened where and when. So that's pretty like much not, most of my memories, I would say. It is, <laughs> about yeah. That. Yeah, that's kind of the whole, that's all I got, yeah. Right. So not the memory of like knowing that the Eiffel Tower is in Paris, for example, yeah. but the memory of the first time going to Paris. Right. So I could and, do OK on Jeopardy, but not recognize my sibling or whatever. Right. Not to oversimplify, but that kind of thing. Right. And those deteriorate in different, totally different ways. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They have completely different. Um, there are several different types of memory. Um, so, yeah, those memories deteriorate in a different way than, than those factors 
based memories um, and also the kind of memories of like how to do things. So like the mm. riding a bike kind of memory right. um, is separate again. And you can have you can find studies on people who had different types of damage to their brain. Maybe they were in an accident of some kind, or they had some kind of dementia. Who've been you know generous enough to give some time to people who were able to figure out that there are different, to some extent, different neural substrates, different parts of the brain underlie those different types of memory. Are there others besides those three? Um, there are. Yeah, there are a couple of others. There's really, really rapid types of memory. Um, and now I'm a bad neuroscientist because I can't remember what they're called. Ah, I'm putting you on the spot. I can't remember facts of any kind. So I know the Eiffel Tower is in Paris, but I don't know much else about right. the world. And so these sorts of questions are a nightmare for me. They're like, what was the name of the paper that did the, I don't know. I have no idea. Maybe I can look that up at the All end. Right, yeah. I don't, I don't want to hold <laughs> this worry. up too much, but there's don't another worry, like yeah. super, super rapid kind of memory. Um, and then there's short-term memory. Ah. Which is which is just you know the memory like um, if I was re- telling you my phone number you might hold a few digits in your mind until right. you could type it into your phone right that kind of memory so there's I think the most well known are, the, are those are those um, so there's a short term memory it's sometimes called working memory because you can do mm. like mental math or calculations or consider something while it's hanging out there and then, and then you have forever. of your yeah. long term memories you have you have this um, declarative memory, memory that you can talk about and describe. Uh Uh And then you have these procedural memories or the memories of how to do, which is sometimes really hard to describe, which is why it's hard to teach sports and skills. Right. Because you can't just tell someone the Eiffel Tower's in Paris and expect them to know how to, I don't know, like ride a mountain bike down the stairs of it. (laughs) Like I keep telling you about the Eiffel Tower. What's the matter with you? Yeah. Right. I'm I'm having a newfound respect for some of my circus coaches who are able to explain how to do something because it does seem impossible now that I think about it. So, okay. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah. And it's harder the longer time you spend between Mm. when you first learned it and when you, yeah. So I used to teach music. I used to teach the flute to kids and then I taught swimming to kids and then I taught water polo to adults and like, just trying to remember how did I learn that? Right. And now I have to put it into words. Right. That's very, very challenging. Right, right. Yeah, but it's a different kind of memory entirely. And so people with dementia um, often don't lose those kinds of memories. Right. Um, they, they're much more likely to lose their, their autobiographical memories, sadly. Which is very um, sad, yeah. Yeah, which is really sad because it, it includes things like, yeah, like remembering what your sister currently looks like. Right. Yeah. Or your, yeah, trip with your husband or your kid's birthday or, I mean, I would rather have those than be able to ride a bike. I think uh, if 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 I can choose, I don't know if that's part of the deal. So so okay. So you're doing a postdoc and you're researching and your research. I know you said at the beginning that you aren't doing a ton of active research now. Did you stay in the dementia memory loss area? Is that kind of your thing within neuroscience? Yeah. So my PhD was actually on decision making, which was really cool and interesting, and I really liked working in that field but I equally liked the memory field. It's all cognitive neuroscience, which is, which is the process, the processes by which the brain, you know, takes in information and makes something of it so that you can do something with it. And so I didn't see, you know, I enjoyed both of those. I I didn't really see it as a difficult choice, Um, but then I ended up staying in memory for the rest of my time in academia. So what happened was my postdoc advisor moved to the US about two years after I started working with him. And he said, would you, you to the lab in general, it was a small lab, would you like to come? And I said, sure, I'll come for a year. And that was 12 years ago. Ah. Uh, So (laughs) I actually just became a US citizen last week. Last week. Well, welcome to the sinking ship and uh, not to be political, but that's awesome. One week ago. How does it feel? Uh, it feels great, actually. It's cool. It's good. It's what have good. you done? Yeah. What have you done to celebrate or what? I guess you can't you find an election to vote in. Like what? What have? <laughs> what does one do to celebrate? That's so great. Congrats. Uh, I can register to vote. So that's yes. exciting. I'll good. be doing that uh, ASAP uh, and I can get a passport. That would be nice. That so I'll be nice. doing that. 
Yeah. Um, but uh, I went out with a friend of mine who is also a swimmer and she bought me a great deal of US flag themed swimming gear. Amazing. <laughs> and uh, we, we celebrated uh, with a little happy hour slash swimming gear party. That's awesome. That's amazing. I would have loved to walk by that party if it was at a bar or something, be like, why do those people have all this patriotic swimsuits uh, at 6 p.m.? <laughs> <laughs> I, when I put, the, when I put yeah. the cap on, I made some new friends right, right, that, right. that moment, you know, those like wow. egg, egghead silicon caps. It was. I mean, was. I always like to give guests uh, it, to choose if you have a favorite photo for your, you know, the thumbnail for the podcast episode. But if I might have to insist on a photo of you in the swim cap, just so you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can prepare accordingly. Uh, that's amazing. Wow. Well, huge great congratulations. Fun. Yeah. So, Thank okay. You, you were going to come for a year, yada, yada, yada. It's 12 years later and you're a citizen. Did you stay in the U.S. the whole time? I did. Yeah, I did. Okay. I applied. So I got a fellowship for my postdoc. So I stayed there um, on that fellowship for a little bit longer. And then I went on the faculty job market. I looked all, all over the U.S. and Canada, but I was really drawn to stay in the U.S. and Canada because they are very supportive of new researchers in my field. So in my field, they, they'll they give you some startup funding to start your lab and start your experiments, even while you're applying for your grant funding to get going. And so I thought that was really cool. And not it's not something you often get in the UK. So they have a really fast tenure process in the UK. You can become a lecturer straight away, mm. but they don't give you any research support. You are kind of have to do that on the side, find your own grants to do it. And what I was doing was so it was difficult, expensive research, which is just to say it's research, really. Right. And I felt like that this was going to be the best place for me to be. Um, but I only got one job offer, and it turns out you only need one. That's all you and need. It was, yep. it was at the same place I was doing my postdoc. Oh, fabulous. And so I got to stay in New York, and I ran a lab there for five years. I did think about moving to France for a while. Nice. What was drawing you to France? Uh, A collaborator who was, you know, I was doing some really cool work on, so I, because I worked on monkeys, I was also really interested in brain evolution and how our brains are similar and different to the brains of other species, particularly primate species. And so we have quite a nice side set of side projects going on, doing comparative anatomy, um, looking at the, the, the morphology, the shape of brains, the size of different brain regions, the connections between them and comparing those. And so I would have really liked to keep going in, in that, in that work. And he suggested that maybe I move relocate and that we could keep doing that work more actively. Uh, I also thought that um, the medical school environment I was in in the U.S. was quite, uh, it was very competitive and they really wanted a lot of big funding. And I was quite tempted to move to a place where I could do more teaching and have more of balance, mm. I think. So to like grant world, basically. It was really grant world. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of people really thrive in that world, especially if they really love research. But what I hadn't banked on was how much I love teaching hmm. and how I, I kind of miss, you know, in, in, in a med school, you have graduate students and some medical stu- students to teach. There's no undergraduate teaching there. Hmm. I was really missing teaching in some ways. What role were music and swimming playing in your life by this point? Uh, So I stopped playing water polo when I moved to the U.S. because I burned out on that a little bit because Uh I do everything too hard. Uh, So I've been playing in the National League in the U.K. (laughs) I'm stunned by how modest. uh, I don't know if that makes you feel weird, but you're like, oh, yeah, it was pretty good. I like played in the National League. Amazing. Okay. Well, not for the national team. I just want to qualify that. Yeah, yeah. so I was traveling all over the country playing matches and I, I was really exhausted from doing that. Okay. Um, I hadn't been, pl- and I hadn't been playing music at all. I just hadn't really had the time. Uh, okay. So when I moved to the US, I just started swimming for fun. And and I had no money because I was a postdoc, which is like being a grad student, basically. Right. And, yeah. and, like, and I, I, so I couldn't afford any of the lovely 
sports clubs and gyms that were available here in our fine city. But what I could afford was the free New York City summer pool scheme. Oh, okay. Which is incredible. So there are all of these open air pools that open up between July 4th and Labor Day. And they're completely free. They have a lap swim program in the morning and evening. You can count your miles based on an honor system. And at the end of it, they throw a party that's catered by Katz's Deli. And they have races and they have a synchronized swimming display. And they have all this amazing stuff. And it's all free. You get t shirt It's great. And so I joined in with that program and I started swimming there even before I figured out like a pool to swim in the rest of the year. Right. And resourceful. Well done. That's where I met the open water swimmers. Uh huh. Tell us more about open water swimmers. So I met that seems to be a big part of your life now, right? Okay, good. Huge. 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 Okay. Here, let's hear it. Yeah. So I met someone who said, Oh, you're a pretty good swimmer. You should think about doing the red lighthouse swim. And I asked what that was. And, and he said, it's a 10 kilometer swim in the Hudson. <laughs> that was insane. the combination yeah. of words that he used. Yeah. Yeah. And I shouldn't say insane, but that's a very intense proposal. You know, when I moved to New York, I had a friend tell me that I should say yes to everything mm. unless it was dangerous. And this was definitely striking me as dangerous. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> like no combination of those. 10 kilometers swim, firstly, that's really, that's a marathon. Yeah. It takes the same amount of time to swim 10 kilometers as it takes most people to run a marathon. Secondly, the Hudson. <laughs> yeah, the Hudson is a busy port or a busy, I don't know, I've never even put my toe in the Hudson, never mind 10 kilometers. Okay. But, busy shipping area. Um, yeah. And it's. It's a fast flowing, it's a tidal estuary. So whichever way the tide is going, it's flowing fast that way. (laughs) That's the way you're going. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, no to that, obviously. Uh And then uh, another friend from the pool uh, told me that she wanted to do this other swim that was much shorter that was under the Brooklyn Bridge. And she wanted to do it because she was turning 60. Okay. And I, I was a bit shamed, if I'm honest. I was like, oh. Well, if she can do it and she's turning 60, I probably can do it. Right. And it was much less distance, even though it was in the East River, which is arguably worse than the Hudson for water quality. Especially. I was, I was going to say, I don't know why and I don't have any numbers, but I just assume the East River is filled with dead bodies. And maybe I'm just building that off of Seinfeld when Kramer goes swimming in the East River, but it seems grim. It. I have no reason to believe that it's not like that, honestly, but... Anyway, I I did it anyway, and it was amazing. <laughs> wow. I like I just like there was something about it. Just swimming under that bridge, you never get that view of a bridge yeah. from any other way. I literally and, can't imagine it. I've gone over the bridge. I've looked at the bridge. I've this, but wow, okay. And, and the feeling of achievement of having done something like that was I don't think I've ever experienced a feeling like it outside of doing an open water swim. Wow. And I just, I was so, oh, and I won a little prize as well. I love a prize. Yeah. I came like fourth in my age group or some arbitrary category like that. And I just was like, oh, my friend's kids were there and they thought I was the most amazing thing ever because I'd like won a prize in this swim. That's awesome. And I just, I was so hooked. I was so hooked. And, and so I started doing that. And I, I just built it up over time until I was doing longer and longer swims. And that's that's my thing now. That's my sport that I do. How long is your longest swim? Has your longest swim been? It was in February of 2020, which is kind of amazing. Wow. Oh, this is a, okay. So two, two answers to this question. This is the longest time that I've spent in the water was the ah. February of 2020 swim. It was in Australia. Wow. In West Australia from Perth to this island called Rotnest Island, which is where those little marsupials called quokkas live. They look like they're always smiling. Oh, I don't know those, but I, I like, I'm going to Google image search those and spend a lot of time with them. I think. I highly recommend that you do that. Okay. How do you spell, spell, how do you spell the name of this? Q-U-O-K-K-A. I like it. I like it already. Okay. Um, 
and I think they only live there maybe you know Australia is very this yeah. is our thing um so that took seven hours and 39 minutes that's when wow are you wearing wetsuits are you freezing to death are you snorkeling no wetsuits no snorkels you're allowed a swim cap goggles regular bathing suit um it was very jellyfishy oh, did you get stung I did. I got stung right here where I now have a tattoo. Oh, nice. I'm trying to did show you... it, but it's at the wrong angle. Here it is. Oh, and it is a jellyfish. Okay. <laughs> All right. The tattoo came after the stings. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, that would have been really amazing. And the jellyfish are like, oh, hello, friend. Ding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this is my reminder that it's their ocean, not mine. Uh, wow. Yeah. Um, if, if you're only listening to the audio, it's worth jumping over to YouTube to see the, the jellyfish. It's a huge jellyfish tattoo. Yeah, did I, did I get it? There we go. I think Beautiful. I just yeah. about got it in there. Ooh. Okay. How do you know where to go on these swims? Uh, oh, you have a boat supporting you. Okay. And you usually have a kayaker as well who's by your side um, and they're guiding you. You're not allowed to to, to follow in their wake because that would obviously be right. helpful. Right. Um, but you're allowed, they're allowed to point in the right direction for you or be far enough ahead that they're not giving you any help, but they're kind of directing you. You can't see anything when you're in the water. Right. I was like, the goggles must do almost nothing right in ocean water. They just protect your eyes. Basically okay. that's okay. it from jellyfish. Um, <laughs> Are yeah. you swimming with other people? Is it all one big group? Like, a, like I'm imagining how like a triathlon would look. It looks like that to begin with. And then usually everyone spreads out. Right. I did that swim tandem with a friend. So we stuck together for the whole swim. Oh, nice. Um, and then the longest swim in distance I've done was in the Hudson. Okay. It was from the Tappan Zee Bridge to the George Washington. And that's, that's really far. Almost 16 miles. Wow. And I think I mentioned that that fast current. Yeah. So I see. that took me less than five hours. That's I think it was about four and a half hours that swim. But that was the toughest swim I've done because it was cold. Oh. It was early. It was like June. So the water hadn't warmed up very much right. yet. And and a lot of swimmers really train for the colds. They're dedicated. They go in the ocean all year round or the lake if they're by a lake. And some of them even um, gain weight to protect wow. themselves. And, and I am not dedicated to that I see. craft. <laughs> the cold water plunge. What is going on in your mind at, you know, at the midway point for these long swims? I mean, you're a couple hours in, you have a couple hours to go. Are you not? Are you singing songs? I don't know what I would do. I'm glad you asked about the midway point because at the beginning point, I'm freaking out. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> like I'm, I'm very worried about you know the cold and uh, what is else is in the ocean with me and and all of the ways that I could die. Yeah. Uh, and then and then, but by the middle, <laughs> I'm usually singing in my really? head. Do you have yeah. songs like go to songs? Yeah, I usually pick a few and and I. I, I, I don't tend to really like sing a whole song through in my head. I, I tend to like pick a chunk of it and kind of play it on repeat. Okay. A lot. I like Lizzo songs. Nice. They're very motivational. Yeah. So I'll like pick a chunk of that and I'll play it in my head for about 30 minutes. That's when I stop for a drink break and that has all my nutrition in it as well, my drink. And then and someone um, has that on the boat, I guess. Yeah. And they, yeah. they're not allowed to touch me, but they can like kind of throw it at me and oh, then I can wow. throw it back. <laughs> they're like this orca and sea world. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Is, frankly, the orcas would probably like to be out in the river, but we'll set that aside. Yeah. <laughs> so then I'll play like a chunk of that, of a, of a different song for the next 30 yeah. minutes. So it's very, I, I, I think it's very meditative mm. to be in that space. Um, it's, I'm not really thinking I'm not noticing the time passing in that way. I'm not really like ruminating on much. In fact, if I do ruminate on stuff, it can really throw me off. Like mm -hmm. if I'm worrying about something and I, I, that can really ruin a swim for me. So I'm more just trying to get into this literal flow state. Literally in all the ways. Yeah. In all the ways where I'm focusing on the rhythm of my stroke, the rhythm of whatever music's playing in my head. If I can't get there, I'll just count. Yeah, strokes yeah. wow and just kind of there's there's something incredibly beautiful about that wow what is it about being in the open water compared to doing this in a pool mm. 
the open water is firstly it has no turns right but so you know in a pool i'm literally going up and down i guess it's like running on a track i was gonna say maybe this is a boring question like track i obviously would rather run on a trail than a track maybe that's not obvious but yeah that makes sense to me but i I mean it just does it feel different like does the water itself feel different yeah, I guess there's more to it than that. So it's not just yeah. that you can keep going in a straight line. Yeah, it feels vast. Yeah. But you're very low down, so you really can't see all that far. And you're either swimming around something like Manhattan, in which case there's lots to look at, but it's all kind of huge and high up. Or you're swimming in a channel where there's nothing to look yeah. at. There's just horizon. There's there's just ocean and and sky and the boat and the kayak that's with you. And that is incredibly humbling. Yeah, I bet. Because you're not even in a boat. I'm sure anyone who's been on a boat in the middle of nowhere and you can't see the land is humbling enough, but you're you're just in the water by yourself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's also something about, you know, it's a community event doing an open water swim. You can't do it on your own. You have to have that boat. You have to have that person making up those feed bottles and hurling them at you. Yeah. And- shouting encouragement and the kayaker and you know, I wouldn't make it through any of these swims without any of those people. And I spend a lot of time doing that for other people. I was going to say, how, do people volunteer to do that? But that's part of the community. It sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I started off doing that long before I did long swims. Okay. I I would just sit on the boat all day and watch somebody else swim around and wow. make sure they were safe. And, and that got me excited to do my own swims into I, I, there's just something really incredible about setting my mind to something that is basically impossible. Mm-hmm. I guess as close to impossible as it can be. Yeah. To do this, and it's all mental. I mean, of course, I can physically swim for that length of time. I don't often know that before because no, I don't want to do that in a pool. I was going to say, how are you training for this? Are you do you swim regularly to some extent, or are you cross training, or I swim, yeah, I swim most most days and when I'm in high training mode. And the longest session I'll do in a pool is four hours. That's a really long time. <laughs> and it's really like, it's it's like not very fun, no. four hours in a pool. It's, no. it's really, yeah. I can't do more than I, a few laps and then I'm like, I, I can't look at the floor anymore. Right. <laughs> Basically, the stripe is killing me, yeah. <laughs> So I've never trained, you know, if I train for a longer swim, I may try and do a longer open water swims, but I'm to train for it, but I'm not going to do it longer than four hours in a pool because it's just too much. Also, most pools don't stay open for more than four hours, (laughs) especially in COVID. Yeah. Um, I do cross train. Yeah. I, I, in an ideal world, I would do a lot of strength training too, Mm. um, which again, COVID kind of closed gyms for a while. So I'm getting back into that now. I do a ton of yoga because that helps with both the mental and the physical. Mm. Okay. My, my mother is a yoga teacher and a good friend of mine who I think listens to this. So they'll appreciate the, the, the shout out to yoga's benefits when it comes to these more extreme, these, these extreme sports. Uh, and you mentioned before we started recording, if it's okay to mention that you had also done some pole dancing for a while and you got a pole and all that stuff. So how does that fit into it? To this whole picture, uh, it definitely doesn't fit in at Great. all. Um, Great. I love it. <laughs> so I kind of stumbled on the pole dancing by chance because one of my water polo team, when I lived in England, wanted to do it for her birthday, mm. and I just thought it was very, very fun. And then I found a class in Oxford, and a friend of mine uh, who worked in my lab at the time, she and I started going together we went in on a pole together Ooh, true <laughs> we could practice and yeah. she had a house and and with like a dining room and we put it up in the dining room and we would practice there and I really loved it because I just thought it was so you know I I aside the open water swimming is the only sport I've done where I've had to rely on my own mental strength mm. mostly what I like is activities where I'm interacting with other people and I'm being physically challenged in a way that's like very varied. So like synchronized swimming, water polo is a team sport. It's very intellectually demanding. You've got to strategize. I thought pole dancing like satisfied that because I was 
trying things all the time and I had to think about it as well as do it. And open water swimming is, is kind of different from that, right? It's the same movement again and again and again. I used to row as well in college. It's the same thing. It's just the same movement, perfecting it. Right. Pole was totally different for me. It was the same movement. I can never perfect it. Right. Uh, <laughs> it was quite and you're always learning new ones and there's all this stuff you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard and, and difficult and it's quite interactive, you know, unless you're practicing at home on your own, which honestly isn't super safe. Right. <laughs> I was just going to say anyone listening who's an instructor is like, don't do that, please. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, practice with it. That's one of the reasons I haven't put the poll up very much because during the pandemic, there were some virtual classes mm-hmm. um, that I could take. But if I was just doing it on my own, I didn't feel like that was a very safe thing to do never swim alone in the open water either same deal right right um anyway I thought it was great I uh, I haven't had much time to do it recently but I really loved it when well, I, did I, it. I would like to go back to it I love what you said about it's you it relies on your own of course physical strength and same with open, open water swimming but also when you said the piece about needing your own kind of like mental focus or trusting your own ability to execute something I mean what is that is, is that because you, you die if you do the skill wrong, basically? Is that what you mean by that? Um, no, I guess, I guess it's just like with the swimming, it's just staying in it. Mm. The hardest thing is staying in it. Like it's so easy to quit something like that. Right. It's just you. Right. There's no, like I quite often have this battle at the beginning of the season, I'll go down to the beach to swim and maybe it'll be like May or June. The water's not super warm yet. And maybe I will swim alone in that there's people on the beach who know I'm in the water, but maybe there's no one on my speed who's matching me stroke for stroke. And so who's going to care if I get out early? I see. Right. Nobody's going to care if I get out early. And it's kind of like getting yourself to training, right? right? There's many a morning when I wake up to swim and it's not five these days. It's like 6.30, but still. Still, it's still pretty early to get into the Hudson given I've never get, gotten into the Hudson. Right. Uh, what time of day it is, so. <laughs> and yeah. on a regular day, even going to the pool, I'll be like, why would I right. do this? And I've asked myself that question almost every morning I've gotten up to train ever, sometimes out loud. Yeah. <laughs> What am I doing? So why do you do it? Do you know? I mean, if you if you knew, I guess you wouldn't answer, you wouldn't ask every day. I do know now. I didn't know for the longest time why I really, really needed it and why I fell apart when I didn't do it. But it turns out it's I've been self-medicating my anxiety with mm. swimming mm. for my whole life. Yeah. I could see how that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So anxiety, I didn't know that I had yeah. that went undiagnosed for a long time. Um, like when I was a kid, I just thought everybody felt guilty about everything all the time and didn't mm-hmm. sleep. Mm-hmm. And now mm-hmm. I know that it's a thing, but it's, it's, it's so effective for me and I can really see the difference. And, and when the pools all closed, yeah. You know, at the end of the summer when it got too cold for me to swim, it was noticeable for me that I wasn't managing mm. my anxiety nearly as well because I couldn't get in the pool and just and just well, I'm not I think it's a combination of that like sensory deprivation. Mm-hmm. And I just did one of those flotation tank things last week with a friend who was like, You've got to try this, you've got to try this. And I realized that I get a lot of that from swimming, that mm. kind of like feeling of being held and floating. Um, and also just that, that process of blanking my mind and making those repetitive yeah. movements. The kind of rhythmic nature of it. Yeah. I get a little bit of it when I knit. Right. Uh, there's other things like that, I think, that, that serve that same purpose. But for me, there's nothing like swimming. Wow. Are you, and you're, you're able to do it now. Are things open enough? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Pools are open. Um, not fully, but the, there's usually some kind of system to get into a pool okay. and do it. And 
yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm beginning to think about making goals again after okay. that big Aust- Australia swim was my last really big one. So one of the things I l- love about doing this show and I love about all the guests that come on is that when I first thought of inviting you on the show, it was because of your work at Story Collider and the intersection of storytelling and neuroscience. And uh, also some of your really awesome posts online about the neuroscience of why stories are so powerful. And little did I know we would talk about swimming in the Hudson and now I kind of want to swim under the Brooklyn Bridge. So amazing, amazing. We'll <laughs> Yay. Have to talk about that further. But before uh, before we go, are you, well, oh, I have so many questions. So so I've kept you for so long, but I'm, I'm dying to know, leaving the formal academic world is typically a very big deal. And I imagine we could have several episodes just about that, but I would love to know sort of what that decision was like. Was it to go into SciComm? Was, was it tortured? Was it obvious? Uh, and then I want to hear a little bit more about your current, your current everyday work, but that pivotal moment sound, you know, was it a pivotal moment? Let me leave it there. It was really, it was a gradual process for me because I loved, I loved my academic work so much. I, I really, I loved being an assistant professor. I loved doing research. I really thought that was what I was going to do until the end of my days. I was going to say retirement, but academics don't really retire. No, they no. just knock around. I thought I would be knocking around, right. um, you know, just knocking on people's doors and going, I cited you today, which is what <laughs> my favorite professor at Oxford did. That's awesome. And um, and so I just, it took me a long, I was quite resistant to the idea that I would leave. Um, and I, I think I was pushed and pulled. So I, I was really burnt out. I, I was working, I would say between 80 and 90 hours a week, every week. And the reason I managed to do that, because that kind of sounds like an impossible number to people who aren't from the USA, um, is that I worked seven till seven on my weekends. Oof in addition yeah. to my weekdays. Um, but I also was, was you know, I, because I was missing teaching so much, I think, and I was even thinking about moving to, to have more of that, I was doing a lot of science outreach and public engagement work on the side. Just, mm. it wasn't work. It was just for, for I get volunteer work, I guess. Right. So I was doing, um, for example, there's a week in March called Brain Awareness Week, um, where lots of people just share things with with the public. There might be um, a brain fair or a talk about something. And I was really into that and I did it every year. And and one year I was reaching out to potential partners and one of the faculty who was my colleague said, oh, you should definitely reach out to the Story Collider. Uh They would love to do a show about the brain, I'm sure. And they did want to do a show about the brain. And then they asked me if I would like to tell a story in the show. And I said, yes, because, you know, my friend told me to say yes to everything. Right, right, right. Good, good friend. And then, and then I called them back and I said, no, <sighs> I don't want to do this. And I had a lot of reasons. Um, like the only stories I thought I had that were interesting were about monkeys. And I didn't want to tell stories about monkeys on stage um, in front of strangers. And I didn't think I had any other interesting stories to tell. And what, one of them, Erin uh, Barker, who's now the executive director of yeah. Story Collider. Um, so she sat with me on the phone and sort of drew out of me what a story might be. And it, she asked me if I had anybody in my family who was dealing with mental health issues. And I said, well, my grandmother had Alzheimer's disease, but I don't really think there's a story there because um, everybody knows somebody with Alzheimer's disease. I don't, I don't know that that's interesting. She said, oh, OK, what do you work on? Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, you know, I work on autobiographical memory, um, kind of memory that's lost when people have dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And she said, oh, no story. huh?" And that was back in 2012 or 2013. And. After I told that story, I just couldn't have predicted the connection that I would have with the people in the audience that day. I played music on stage most of my life, even back when I was a classical musician in school concerts or whatever. I've I've always shared the artistic side of myself, but I'd never shared the science side of myself like this. Mm. 
And the people that came up to me after that story were just like so grateful to me for sharing my experience. And some of them wanted to hug me. And I just, it just changed my entire Oh, I just wanted to swear, but then I remember we were on a podcast. Oh, just, you can swear if you want. This is uh it just changed my entire fucking life telling that story. And I I just it just like changed there's something that I think that was a pivotal moment, actually. And then I stayed on, I got a faculty job, I carried on doing what I was doing for years and years and years. And and if uh, when I was deep into my faculty job, work, working these 90-hour weeks, I saw this opportunity to become a producer for the story collider and I thought to myself I don't have time to do this and I did it anyway and I think I did it because I knew that I might want to do something different and I kind of needed to know if I could because I couldn't be a biochemist because I was bad at it like what if I was bad at this I couldn't jack in my whole career for this but I think so I think I think I knew before I knew if you'd asked me I wouldn't have told you that I was going to leave I I think I I just had to kind of try it and and it was so telling you know I would come home at the end of these incredibly long days and I'd be completely exhausted and I would still want to work on a story with somebody and I think Yeah. And I think one thing that I love about science communication in general is that it's so much more immediately rewarding than research. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Research, the rewards come years and years and years potentially afterwards. Yeah. Like I never did a piece of research on a day and have a complete stranger tell me how much they appreciate it because they never even saw that, right? They didn't see it for maybe six years until I published the paper. Right. And so I think that was very appealing to me. I also had become so aware of all the inequities that are present in science as a reflection of society, right? It's not a microcosm and how important it seemed to do more to right some of those wrongs. And I wasn't in a position to do that as a researcher. I was just trying to do my research and put my head down. And so that was also really something that I started to care a lot about And that's when I started looking for other jobs. And I only saw a couple and I saw this job at the Zuckerman Institute that was neuroscience, science, communication and public programming. And I thought, oh, someone's made me a job. How nice of them. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say that's a perfect fit. It really is. It really is. It was just just like somebody had made me this position uh, with me in mind and and. So I just got the courage at that point to go for it wow. and, and to make the switch. And it's still, it's still the hardest decision I ever made, like much harder than my decision to move to the U S mm-hmm. much harder than all of those decisions to put science before my other things. It's, it was so incredibly difficult to do. And I wrestled with it for, for a really long time and I haven't regretted it for a single moment. Are you comfortable sharing what made that so hard or at least a few of the things that made it hard? I think being a scientist was part of my identity. And I thought that being a scientist meant being a researcher. And I internalized it so much that I wanted to get a tattoo of of neurons. Mm. But I was scared that if I got it and then I didn't make it, which is a very common fear in academics, right? That mm-hmm. not, not that we're going to leave of our own volition, but that we're not going to make it, that someone's going to kick us out. Right. I, I am, honestly, I constantly believe someone was going to kick me out the whole time I was doing Same. it. Same. Yeah. And I felt like if I got this tattoo and then, some, and then I got kicked out of academic research or academia, that I, I would be total fraud and I would have these, this like permanent thing that, I chosen to put on my body that wasn't true. Right. Thinking you were someone who could hack it and all that. Oof. Yeah. And I clung to that identity really, really strongly. And so I think that was a big piece of it. There was, there was the love for what I was doing. And there was also this strong feeling that there weren't a lot of women in the field that I was in. Mm. And not neuroscience so much, but it, but in the niche field that I was in, and the kind of work that I was doing, 
And I felt a little bit responsible for being a role model and being there. And it took me a long time to disentangle what I wanted from what other people wanted from me. Mm-hmm. And I'll let you know how that goes because I'm still please, yeah. Working on that. <laughs> I bet you're you're a handful of trips down the Hudson away from uh, <laughs> from letting go of that one. Yeah, keep us posted. We'll have follow up episodes and be like, let's check in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Give me another like forty years and okay, I'll, okay, perfect. I'll I'll send you a calendar invite. We'll do it. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah. And um, and so I think I think that there were lots of things keeping me there, but. And the ident- but the identity one was a big one, right? Because yeah. it was, was my identity. And it wasn't until I quit that I realized what an idiot I was. <laughs> now you don't just stop being a scientist because yeah. you changed your job. Yeah. I mean, I think about everything like a scientist. Yeah. I yeah. still do some research in my spare time. I teach science all the time. I but now I get to to bring my scientific approach to to all sorts of other things. And now I get to create mashups between jazz music and science and art and science and do weird science comedy projects. Mm -hmm. And I get to like think about all of the other ways that science is part of the world. And, and uh, yeah, in between swims, I got that tattoo. You did. Is it somewhere where we can see it or is that totally is I mean, it inappropriate I'm, to show it? it's on my side? <laughs> okay. If you don't mind, I'm, I'd love to see it. <gasps> wow. If you're listening, it's an amazing tattoo uh, that is all up her side. And it's, is it one big neuron? What, what it's is it? Two. It's two neurons that they're kind of neuron called a pyramidal neuron. Um, and they're, they're like the little processing centers of, of the brain. So they sit, um, they sit, they're all over the cortex of the brain, which is kind of our processing area. And they take in multiple inputs and send out single outputs. So mm-hmm. it's almost like they're kind of, um, I, I don't know, like distilling information. So they're the kind of like front line of what we end up thinking about and perceiving, basically. Yeah. They're, they're the conductor. Wow. They are. And wow. I wanted them to run from my heart to my gut. <sighs> That's why they're on my oh, side. I have chills. Amazing. Well done. Well, I am, I mean, obviously you're a scientist, <laughs> not that you need to hear it, but uh, I know exactly what you mean about thinking that changing jobs changes who you are. And I'm very glad that you got around it. Where can people see your, you know, these amazing projects that you're talking about? How can people get involved? Um, oh my goodness. Okay. so. Let's see. So the Story Collider, uh, which is which is the the live stage show and podcast that I work for that shares true personal stories about science, which, by the way, helped me see that everyone can be a scientist. Yes. Even those without PhDs or working mm-hmm. in industry or whatever. Um, so the Story Collider can be found at storycollider.org, or you can look for the Story Collider at any of your favorite podcast venues. Um, the Zuckerman Institute... Um, is I don't remember what our website is. Hold on. <laughs> we'll take that again. Let me just. Ah, okay. The Zuckerman Institute, which is part of Columbia University, is Zuckerman Institute uh, dot Columbia dot edu. Um, or you can just search for that. It's Zuckerman, not Zuckerberg. Ah, Common confusion. Noted. Yeah. Um, but if you search for Columbia's Neuroscience Institute, you'll find it. Um, and we have a lot of programming going on. Uh, it's, a lot of it's virtual right now, so you can watch it from anywhere, um, including those fabulous uh, science and art uh, mashups, science and music mashups that I was talking about. Um, if you want to check out my band, then you can check us out or follow us at Marlo Gray or MarloGray.com. Uh, that's spelt in the British way for some reason known only to the Americans who started the band. Uh, <laughs> so that means what Marlo with an E and then gray with an E rather than an A, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's right. right. Yeah. Lots of E's. Yeah, um, we like, we like E's around here. So, and now that you're an American, you better get used to these E's. So <laughs> that was, that's obviously on the test. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then uh, if you want to follow my open water swimming, uh, you can check out Sibos. That's Coney Island 
are Brighton Beach Open Water Swimmers. Um, and that's the group that uh, trains and swims uh, all year round down at Coney Island. Um, we have lots of amazing ways for even the most beginnery of beginners oh, to get involved and right. jump in the ocean. Now, according to your website, you're the co-executive director of this organization. Is that still the, I mean, it seems like you're the director of everything you get involved in, which is the, the main reason I bring that up. That is a giant character flaw of mine, but yes. <laughs> Like you I mentioned am that the current executive and, director. And it pays off, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you can also find me and all of these things about me. This would have been much easier to start with, actually. <laughs> you can find me and all the things about me at paulacroxon.com. Excellent. Um, or by following me at Paula Croxon on all of the platforms except TikTok because I can't figure it out. Oh, yeah. And TikTok's a nightmare. I I know. I know you figured it out. I, I don't know that I have, but I, I I'm learning by doing that it's a nightmare. How about that? I, I hear you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, all of those things are there and you can also just reach out to me if you want to know more about any of those things. There's a nice little contact form on my website. Amazing. Well, I'll link all of those things as well on all the show notes and the YouTube and everything so people can find you. And, and among all these many things, I really recommend your, uh, those pieces I mentioned earlier about the kind of the neuroscience of how stories impact our brain. So good. So amazing. So, so much so much to love. Uh, please also let us know when uh, your pole dancing exhibit is, and we'll come to that <laughs> <laughs> as well. So, we're going all to right. do some serious practice first. All right, good, good. All right, so we have come to existential corner. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, and I have a special. I, I ask guests usually similar questions, but I have a special one just for you. But we're going to start nice and light as we do. What is one huge regret in your life? Or not so huge. Oh, no, I can give you a huge one. All right, let's hear it. Um, but it's really sad. But I guess that was the point of the question. Yeah. yeah. Okay, one really huge regret I have is is that um, I, I never went to see my mom when she was diagnosed with, she had acute myeloid leukemia a lot of years ago, back when there weren't a lot of treatments for it available. And she didn't have very long between her diagnosis and the day that she died. And we agreed that I wouldn't go home because I just started my PhD oh. and she was very proud of me and thought it was very important that I worked at that. And I thought I would see her at Christmas and I did not. <sighs> that is a big one. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm sorry. What's I'm going to keep going. What's your biggest fear? Ooh. so many to choose from. <laughs> uh, well, I th yeah. So I think, I think my biggest fear is, is a life not lived to its fullest, whatever that means. Mm, yeah. I think that results on me putting a lot of pressure on myself, but it also leads to me making a lot of choices that I, I am subsequently very, very glad that I made. Right. Right. So, okay. So here's something lighter. What is something that you're very proud of? I'm very, very proud of my team at Columbia right now. They are really, we have a really small team doing what we're doing. Um, cause what I have is not really a standard job. And they have been absolute heroes throughout this whole pandemic time in particular, just uh, pivoting back and forth from virtual to hybrid to in-person to virtual to hybrid. And they just run incredible programs with an incredible skill and, and joy. And yeah, if I can be proud of something other than myself. <laughs> you found a loophole in my question, but I'll take it. That's good. <laughs> What is uh, a piece of advice? And I know we kind of talked about this, but it doesn't have to be that one, but it can be. What is a, a piece of advice that you were given that has you've hung on to and has been useful for you? Uh, this can also be a piece of advice you've given someone else. Um, yeah, so the, the, uh, the answer I already gave you is yeah. say yes to everything unless it's dangerous. Yeah, I Solid. constantly come back to that, but there's another great one that people love, love. And so I'll share it too. And then you can choose. Okay. Um, which is that when you're deciding whether to do something or not, um, I use the four P's rule 
And you have to have two of the four P's in order to say yes to it. Okay. Um, the four P's, let me see if I can remember. They are passion, prestige, pay, and paying it forward. Ooh. So I had to have two of those in order to say yes to any project that I do. And it helps me say no sometimes. That's very good. And the paying it forward one is like, I don't really want to do it, but it's a way of paying forward something nice that someone else has done for me. Is that, if I got that one right? Yeah. When I was applying for faculty jobs, I asked someone who'd given me a lot of help with my application, how I could repay him. Mm -hmm. And he said, don't pay it forward. Good. And so Without those people who'd helped me, who I can never repay, I would be nowhere. And so I, I'll actually, I'm very passionate about paying it forward. So it's Mm -hmm. very easy for me to say yes to a lot of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, exactly. So you don't have to necessarily be getting paid or love it um, as, as long as you're paying it forward. But remember, you've got to have two. You've got to have two, right. So if, if you didn't love it or get paid for it, then it would have to be a very prestigious paying it forward. Right, right, right. <laughs> I'll try to think of what that would be for me. Very good. I'm going to write these down. That's really good. I can't say no to anything. Okay. What is a secret desire for your life? Something that you want out of your life. You don't usually talk about. Uh, yeah, I want to write a book. Nice. What's a special skill you have that you think most people don't have. It can be however tiny or, or, or not. Uh, I've been told, and I, and I think I am a really good listener. Nice. Well done. All right. I have two more before I get to our last one. Here's my special one just for you. I assume the answer to the first part is you've, so have you held a human brain and what does a human brain feel like? Uh, so I have held a plastinated human brain. So that's a human brain that's been treated with, if you've ever been to that bodies exhibit that was in Times Square for a while, um, you'll have seen lots of body parts that were treated this way. So it's literally treated with plastic um, to make it holdable. Mm. Would so it all I've, fall apart otherwise? Yeah. So so otherwise it would feel roughly the consistency of scrambled eggs. Okay. <laughs> and so if you were to hold it, you, your fingers would dig into it. Mm. So I haven't held a human brain like that. I've only held this, the plastinated one that was donated and then treated before. And so I can pick it up with gloves on and actually, you know, show it to people and, and turn it over and things. Yeah. Um, I have touched a monkey's brain um, very, very carefully during surgery for my work. And I can confirm that it is the consistency of scrambled eggs. And you have to wow. be incredibly careful not to gouge a hole in it accidentally. Right. I was, I mean, are these monkeys alive still or not? They are. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So we would, we would go in and make, make teeny tiny micro injections to, um, to reduce the levels of some of the chemicals in the brain. And then, and then we would have them recover from the surgery, um, with all the appropriate pain medication and things like that. And then we would, then they would carry on doing their tests that we were working on to test their memories. Wow. Okay. And so, and for the human brain, is it, I know I can look up how much it weighs, but does it feel like, do you feel like a superhero when you hold it or it must be so surreal? It's really surreal. (laughs) Yeah. It's very weird. Uh, It feels, um, it's very heavy. Firstly, I I mean, again, the plastination probably makes it a bit heavier, but I think it does weigh like a few pounds. Um, It's roughly the size of of both fists together. So it's pretty substantial. Um, And it's, yeah, it feels very strange and powerful to hold a human brain. And a, a big responsibility, you know, these brains were donated to us by um, unknown donors, so we don't have any details about them. But I know that without them, we wouldn't be able to use those to teach with. Yeah. Okay. I want to donate my brain. I'm going to write that down. That's yes, cool. please. Yes. All right. And then you can put it behind you uh, for the next podcast. Uh, last one. All right. Real easy one. What is the meaning of life? So easy. Yeah. I know. I got to stop with these softballs. (laughs) You'd think I would know the answers. You you know, as an academic, you'd think I would have thought about this before for a long time. Yeah, you could have worked it out. Yeah. 
I mean, I think we have to create, we each have to create the meaning of life for ourselves. I, I, for better or worse, I don't believe in a higher power. And so I don't have the ability to conceptualize a, a meaning of life beyond what I would create for my own life and what everybody else would create for their own lives. So I guess that's the meaning of life subjective. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. We all have our own meaning. That's a great answer. All right. Well, that's it. Paula, thank you so much for joining the show and for sharing your story, your wisdom. And I, I'm going to go swimming in a river right now. <laughs> Probably Definitely not. I need don't a do that. Yeah. Yeah. Won't it's do that. way too cold. Yeah. Get a kayaker, but maybe when it warms up. At least. Yeah. All right. Very good. Well, I'll see you there. So thank you again. I'll link to all your awesome goings on uh, and yeah, get home safe. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And that's our show. Thank you so much for listening to Majoring in Everything. I'm your host, Andrea Jones-Roy. And Majoring in Everything is a proud member of the World's Smartest Podcast Network. Be sure to check out worldsmartestpodcastnetwork.com and our partner shows. We are edited by Eric P. Stipe, who says that I need an outro. So I'm making one. Eric, does this count? Are you happy? I hope so. Thanks again for listening. Keep majoring in everything. Bye.